You ready, Erica? I am. Brian, you're. Yeah, I just heard that the thing is being recorded. So, uh, Annette, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, we're going to go on a record. We're on the record. Uh, good morning. This is the December 13th, 2022 meeting of the Hudson Valley Board of Review. The hearing is uh, being held via video conference uh, WebEx and in person uh, uh, here at the town of Corlin. The time is now uh, 9.27 a.m. and this hearing is officially open. The members of the board are uh, Jane Slavin uh, to my left and your right, uh, Megan Smella to my right and your left, and Sh uh, Shaheen Medali. Uh, to my right and your left. Um, Mark Cavanaugh is uh, joining us uh, remotely. Uh, my name is Marco Generelli. I'm the chairman from the Department of State. We have Erica Krieger uh, to, to your right there. We will now hear the scheduled uh, petitions when you speak. Please address the board and give your name, title, and legal address so that our court reporter can have all the information requested. We may <clears throat> have to stop from time to time to consult with our technical staff. In making comments to the board, please provide a descriptive narrative on matters referring to your exhibits to enable a court reporter to enter these into the record. Uh, an example of that would be if you're referring to a particular drawing or a particular letter, please uh, specify what that is. Okay, the first hearing is that uh, uh, petition number 2022-0545, the agreed party is uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. The petition pertains to a request to rehear an application for a variance to allow construction of four laboratories, occupancy B, uh, I'm sorry, occupancy group B, business construction type 1B, fire resistive, <coughs> Five stories in height, approximately 1,086,300 square feet in gross floor area and located at 777 Old Sawmill River Road, Town of Greenberg, County of Westchester, New York State. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR, Part 1221, the Building Code of uh, New York State. Percentage of maximum allowable quantities, section 414.2.2, which states the percentage of maximum allowable quantities of hazardous materials per control area permitted at each floor level within a building shall be in accordance with table 414.2.2. The petitioner is seeking to reopen the application to allow quantities of hazardous materials in the lower level greater than table 414.2.2. Okay, would somebody please uh, step forward? Just uh, state your uh, your name and title. Before you do that, um, I think, I believe the last time when we heard your case, uh, we had four members, we normally five members. Okay. Um, we have the same four members uh, that, that you had last time, so, um, I guess the question is, do you want to proceed with just four members or would you want to, want to wait till we uh, get a fifth member? No, we'll proceed with four. Okay, so please state your name and uh, title for the record. Yes, my name is Patrick Cox, um, Project Manager at Code Consultants Incorporated. We're a fire protection and safety consultant on behalf of Regenera. Okay, proceed. Yeah, so when we were here uh, last time, we had presented the whole concept of last time being the last board hearing. Well, sorry, let me take a step back. I'm Patrick Cox, right, with co consultants. I also have Regenera on here, uh, Kimberly, and then I also have uh, Architect uh, as well, which is Flat Architect, so that's here as well. We also have the Town of Greenberg on, just in case. Uh, they were on the phone call last time to sort of show their support of the concept. 
Um, so if we have any questions for them, feel free. And then lastly, we also had flat on the phone as well, just in case we have to pull the drawing or something. So when we were here last time in uh, October at the board hearing, we had presented the concept of applying table 414 uh, to two and what we're going to establish as the first story above grade plane. If you recall, we had the elevated plaza level and we wanted to call the first story above grade plane for the application of that table above the plaza, not the level below. Um, I think we all conceptually agree to that concept. Uh, and then one of the conditions of that approval was that below the plaza level within the podium below, we were not allowed to have any research and development control areas. I think when we had described what was below the plaza level, <clears throat> we used the term support areas, which I think on our, on our part, we probably did not describe appropriately. Um, and I think the board understood support areas to be just quite literally support, such as mechanical and electrical spaces. Uh, however, really below the plaza level uh, in the podium, is where the loading dock is and where the materials will get delivered. So there will be some temporary staging down there um, and some temporary storage before the materials get distributed to the lab above. Um, also, there may be an opportunity in the future, because right now it's a little bit some shell space, porn shell. Uh, there may be an opportunity in the future where those areas get fit out for a, a research and development lab space as well. There's also some equipment down there which has to be below the plaza level relative to the dirt on which it sits on, because it's necessary for uh, the, 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 material, the, the machine itself, right? It can't be elevated in the building. And there's some materials associated with that that have to be uh, controlled in a control area. So ultimately, we're here to try to explain again. Um, and maybe we don't do it today, because I know this is just the appeal. We have to do it at the next meeting. Um, but really, our request today is to just appeal the fact that we uh, to not have any control areas below the plaza level and hopefully reopen the case. That way we can explain to you why why we need that uh, in the future. So that's our request today. I don't know if you got our appeal letter. Uh, yes, you did. Okay, yeah. And I think I think it really, just to close this out, I think a really helpful graphic would be on page four where I highlighted what we're trying to do. Uh, oh, yeah, it's, sorry, it looks like it's printed out black and white. I can, I can I can distribute it too, but I can, I'll give you this. Um, but That's ultimately, cool. yeah, we're we're showing the how the we have control areas below, uh, or sorry, above the plaza level, and then we have this one control area below, which is kind of at grade, right? Because the car department can pull up and and actually access this area below the podium, uh, which is theoretically in better condition than if you were to build this, let's say, directly on dirt. So, for example, you could actually go two stories below grade in this building and have control areas if you wanted to. So, the fire department could actually travel two stories down below grade uh, and you could still have control areas. We actually don't even have that case, right? Because we only have one level below the plaza with just one control area down there, and the fire department has direct access to it. They pull a truck right up to it. So, nobody's actually going to the dirt itself. Above it. So, with that, um, that, that's our request today, this sort of reason. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'll uh, just open it up to questions uh, from the board members. Uh, uh, first, Shaheen, you want to go first? Thank you. No questions? Okay. I also have no questions. Jane? No questions. Okay. Um, do you anticipate uh, providing when you present the case back to us, if we decide to reopen and you present the case back to us in February, do you anticipate providing some additional alternatives to try and offset the fact that obviously you're not meeting the code here? Yeah, yeah, I think we can re outline what we had in the building um, and find other areas where we may be able to, to provide some. Extra protection, I think, is really what you're requesting, right? Yeah, something above and beyond what the code requires to to try and offset the fact that you're not obviously not meeting the code. Yeah, yeah, I think I think this is a very important uh, part of the facility. It's quite the facility has to operate with these control areas, so we're willing to to provide something right. when we represent. Okay, thanks. Um, is there anyone here in the room that would like to uh, speak? 
you know, in support of our position um, to this uh, petition to uh, reopen. Is there anyone on the conference call, uh, possibly Tana Greenberg, who would like to make any comments regarding this? Yes, thank you. My name is Garrett Duquesne. I'm with the Town of Greenberg, Commissioner of Community Development and Conservation. Uh, we've worked with Regeneron extensively on this project, and then for this specific request, we have no objection uh, to the applicant's request to have the uh, case reopened, and uh, we will submit a letter uh, in support prior to your February meeting if it gets reopened. Thank you. And this is uh, thank you, Garrett. This is Ben Suzuki. Um, and uh, I, I, the global head of engineering, design, and construction for Regeneron. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I just, um, sorry for my late entry into this meeting, it's unavoidable. But I uh, just want to state that, um, you know, we're not looking to put, you know, a high volume of research space in an area that's really about parking. But there is, you know, if, if you're in the research community, uh, there are some special, special types of equipment like MRIs, PET CTs, things that require very, very stable bedrock or they don't work. We have scanning electron microscopes that have very, very high fidelity images that can see some of the smallest images on the planet. Uh, they're always, you know, with the exception of one that's in North Korea that doesn't work, they're always on a slab, you know, on bedrock, directly down tied to bedrock. So, you know, our, our research facility is from the grade plane up. If there's some, you know, very expensive, high fidelity imaging piece of equipment that we have to put, you know, in a very stable foundation that can't be on an elevated slab. So we're just looking to, you know, be able to have these imaging suites and that kind of thing small, but critical for our research. And I think that was just maybe missed in the translation and what we're trying to express in, in our application before. So this is really essential to us because, you know, it's, we can't we can't look at you know uh, you know hyperscale images and you know we use a cryo uh, freezing in order to take accurate images we have to freeze everything so it slows down the movement of electron you know we have to slow things down and again all of the magnetic fields the uh, stability of the equipment you know uh, it's, it's you know having on grade. Uh, stability is critical for it and it just won't work elsewhere so you know we're looking uh, for the ability to uh, accommodate uh, these high fidelity images and i think somewhere it may have been missed in the, in, in the translation here and that is why uh, you know the heart of the matter here in terms of needing to have some level of space albeit you know very very small you know uh, and limited in scope thank you okay thanks anyone else Okay, not hearing anybody. Um, so we're going to go off the record now to go into deliberations. Did you get Okay. Okay, uh, Annette, we're back on the record. We're on the record. Okay, uh, Megan, do you have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. In regards to petition 2022-0545, agreed party Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, the petition pertains to a request to rehear the application for a variance to allow construction of four laboratories, occupancy group B business, construction type 1B fire resistive, Five stories in height, approximately 1,086,300 square feet in gross floor area and located at 777 Old Sawmill River Road, Town of Greenberg, County of Westchester, New York State. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the Building Code of New York State, percentage of maximum allowable quantities, Section 414.2.2, which states, the percentage of maximum allowable quantities of hazardous materials per control area permitted at each floor level within a building shall be in accordance with table 414.2.2. The board finds the following facts. 
One, petitioner requests to reopen the application after receiving the board's approval at the October 2022 hearing with the condition that no further research and development control areas shall be built in the podium areas below the plaza level. Two, the local code official has been contacted in this matter and does not object to the reopening of the application. Based on the new information, the board finds that the application should be reopened. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a rehearing for a variance from 19 NYCRR Part 1221, Section 414.2.2 be granted. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so we have a motion to uh, grant the request for reopening. So uh, we're now going to vote. A vote for in the affirmative is, would be to reopen the case, and, and no vote would be a vote to not open the case. So we'll vote. Uh, Jane? Yes. Yes. Jean? Aye. Megan? Aye. And I also vote aye. Okay. Procedurally, we didn't do a second on the motion. Is that oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Right. Do we have a second on the motion? Second. Okay. Thanks, Jean. <laughs> second it. Um, okay. So we're uh, off the record. We'll see you in uh, February. We're on the record. Okay. The uh, next petition is petition number 2022-0637. Uh, the agreed party is USRE Hawthorne LLC. The petition pertains to uh, construction of a warehouse occupancy group S1 moderate hazard storage construction type 1A fire resistive one story in height, 226,347 square feet in area and located at 211 Sawmill River Road, town of Mount Pleasant, County of Westchester, New York State. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR, Part 1221, the building code of New York State, Table 601, Fire resistive uh, resistance rating requirements for building elements and hours. Footnote B, which states, except in group F1, H, M, and S1 occupancies, fire protection of structural members in roof construction shall not be required, including protection of primary structural frame members, roof framing and decking where every part of the roof construction is 20 feet or more above any floor immediately below. The petitioner is seeking relief to allow unprotected structural members in roof construction with a group one, F, I'm sorry, group S-1 occupancy group. Uh, is there someone here um, that is going to present the case? Good morning. Um, I get stand up closer to here so we can get this microphone to pick you up. Um, Name and for the record. Sal Pinelli. Okay, I'm the head building inspector for the town of Mount Pleasant. Okay. Um, I can't hear him. You can hear him? No, he's very, it sounds like he's far away from the mic. Can we just move like that mic? I'm sorry. Um, so, Pardon. you typically the applicant would would present the case. I, I, is there someone? Oh, okay. So why don't we let them? You want to let yeah. them do it? Yeah, we'll let them okay. present their case, right. and then we'll get you in. Okay. Like I did in the previous case, I'll open up the floor for questions and comments. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, David Hunter. Okay. Uh, who's my from JW Plan Review, and also Jeff Walker, who's on the, on the Zoom, they will present the case for the town. Yes. Okay, and I know we sent you paperwork. Yes, and we, a letter. We okay. got your letter. Yeah. I'll let them, I'll let David talk, present our, our part of the case on the town. town yeah, but, but, but first we want to let the applicant present their case first. Okay. And then we'll get to okay. the town and any other. Any sure. Other, okay. So. Are they 
he, he was in and he just walked out. So I don't know what's going on. Maybe we're getting more people. There he comes. Yeah. Where's open? So, uh, Annette, we're just going to go off the record for uh, a few minutes and I'll call you when it's ready to go back on. Okay. On, on the record. Okay, this, this is the microphone right here. So, if you want to just stay, if you could stay close to that, that'd be great. Sure. All right, so just state your name okay. for the record. My name is James Burton. I'm here representing AquEst Development for 211 Sawmill River Parkway. Uh, with me today is the architect of record, the engineer of record, and some representatives from Amazon to answer any questions that you might have that they're better suited to answer. Um, we also have the uh, construction manager for the project. So we'd like to start by sharing some storyboards. You've all seen the narrative prepared. Just uh, just raise your voice a little bit. Okay. Right. I'll try to stand right. a little closer okay. to the sorry I get back to you, Mark. <laughs> so the reason that we're here is that uh, there was a discrepancy in the drawings that wasn't discovered until a year after uh, the plans examiner reviewed them. So when that was brought to the attention of the project architect, um, we had a real hardship on our hands. So as we started to get into this and look at all of the other Amazon and other large box warehouses that are being constructed all over the country, um, we realized that there's one fundamental difference and that is almost all of these warehouses are uh, type 2B structures. They're non-combustible, unprotected. There is no um, roof ceiling assembly um, that needs a, an hourly rating. So. You know, what we're trying to illustrate here is the fact that this portion of the design in blue is a canopy. So it's wide open. Um, there's no product out there. Vans come up the ramp, they get loaded, they drive back out, and they go on their delivery route. The actual building here is depicted in blue, and we draw your attention to the fact that the corner of the building is 153 feet from the boundary. Um, and even at the canopy, which is, again, is wide open, uh, all steel, nothing combustible, it's 65 feet or greater away from the only two buildings that are in proximity to this site. So uh, uh, you're all, I'm sure, familiar with section 507.4, which of course permits um, one-story sprinkler buildings to be uh, not combustible construction as long as they're surrounded by a public way of 60 feet or greater. So we reached out to the International Code Council. They're silent on the issue of whether or not a canopy contributes to this, but since the canopy is included in the definition of building area by virtue of the fact that it could be enclosed at some point, then it made sense to just come before the board and seek relief. This second slide is a typical MS. And draw your attention to several things. The first thing is that the joists are unprotected at all. Okay. The second thing that you'll notice is that the plate height is very tall. The third thing that you'll notice is the racks that's, that the product is stored on, relatively short. So seven feet to 10 feet. In this case, um, the fire protection system was designed to protect um, commodities up to 12 feet in height. So that's why we listed that in, in the narrative of our report. The fourth thing that you're going to notice is the aisle spacing. There's a, a very wide berth around these storage areas and the packaging areas for um, uh, operational reasons. Um, there's there's people on the floor, they get an order, then they go pick that order. They need to be able to bring that to a packaging station and package that up to go in the van and, and be delivered in the future.
This is just another illustration of a, of a completed warehouse that happens to be in Philadelphia. It's the Ganyam House. Very tall building, relatively short racks for storage of commodities, and very wide aisle spacing. The product in here is not dense at all. And in fact, um, very well familiar with the fact that Amazon promises to deli deliver most of their orders in one or two days. So this is not a conventional warehouse in the sense that they're stocking product that they hope somebody is going to purchase. They move this product very rapidly. Product comes in, product goes out. So you don't see a lot of, they don't make a lot of money off of product sitting on the shelf. This next board is taken from the construction camera on site. This is number this is number four. Just for the record, I'm just trying to get it. Yes, yes, thank you. Yep. So board number four is showing uh, a picture taken three and a half weeks ago of the actual project. So you'll see the the portion that has the white roof on it. That's the actual building. That's where the product is stored and and packaged up to go. Um, this canopy over here that we illustrated on the first board um, isn't complete. It will extend all the way out to the east side of the building. Um, but this is again, this is a this is an open canopy. There's a, a retaining wall here just because there's a steep drop off in grade. Um, and again, this illustrates just how far away the actual building where um, you know a, a fire would potentially start it's 216 feet from the existing building over here um, from the county arc um, and again 153 feet from the property line a question what is that opening oh they're just proceeding with the construction it's no the opening in the it looks like that that's a overhead door opening down here to the right of that to the right of it yes yeah there's uh, underground parking levels okay underneath the, the warehouse itself. Okay, so the open canopy is actually over the That's parking right. area. Yes. So while you bring that up, I'd like to note that the transfer slab that separates the warehouse from the parking underneath is a three-hour reinforced concrete slab. So it doesn't contribute to the building area. So slide number five shows what the hourly rating would need to be. Again, the code is silent on the hourly rating for a canopy. It's not an enclosed building. Um, it, it only contributes just by virtue of the reference to overhangs in the definition of building area that overhangs um, that could someday be enclosed contribute to the building area for the building. Um, and the building area is, is not relevant here because it's an unlimited area building at you know. So I draw your attention to this excerpt from the IBC commentary. Uh, and this is really significant. Because of their excellent record in controlling fires, the installation of the sprinkler system throughout single story buildings of the specified groups, and note that the specified groups include S1, which is what we're dealing with here individually or in combination permits such buildings to be unlimited in area. So the code has long recognized from the very first International Building Code in 2000 that single story sprinkler buildings pose no significant risk because sprinkler systems historically contain the fire to the room of origin. We're gonna, we're gonna draw on that a little bit later here. So, Another excerpt here taken from the IBC commentary. The life safety hazards in buildings of these occupants be, occupancies because of the typical activities of the occupants and their level of awareness. So this is not a building that's open to the public. Um, these are people that are very aware. They run fire drills. Um, they, they know where all of the uh, exits are. And because of the hazards are considered low, 
low enough that larger building areas and increased fire loads can be tolerated. This is board number six, and, and we, we prepared this board just to share with the board of review the fact that there's an interpretation here, because um, sometimes the local officials might say, well, you know, it's, you, you have parked cars there, or you're going to have vans there, and doesn't that create a hazard, um, and shouldn't that be um, uh, permitted within the 60-foot open space? And the interpretation from the IBC is that parking is permitted. And in fact, I would argue that a parking lot that holds very densely packed private passenger vehicle poses a greater risk, risk than the cube vans that are spaced far apart underneath this canopy moving all the time. They're not sitting there. They're moving. One of the things that we did to try to share with the board the low level of hazard associated with this particular kind of a facility is we ran a smoke model. So I only brought one copy of this. I'm sorry, it's quite large. You're welcome to, uh, to keep that for the record. That's the output file from the smoke model. All right, so we'll mark this as uh, Exhibit Z. What, do we need to have this as an exhibit also? Well, all right, we, this, so this was not a part of the original package. Mm -hmm. no, okay, so, all right, so we'll, actually, we'll, we'll make that Exhibit Z, which is the, the boards that you're, you're going to, you have to leave this with us? Sure, well, we'll yeah, leave that's yours. I'll have that, okay. Yeah. And then we'll, that will mark this smoke uh, model as it exhibit uh, one. Okay. okay. So that actually is contained in the narrative. We do describe that as one of the mitigating factors. So here again, you take a look at the height of the racks over here in proximity to that tall height of the ceiling. So this line right here represents the smoke interface layer. So when we run a smoke model, what we do is we pick a location on the floor where the fire is likely to start, if one starts, that would generate enough smoke and hot gases to set off the sprinkler system, okay? So I'll show you in, a, in another slide where that takes place in this particular facility, but. Um, product sometimes comes off the shelf in it, and then it gets taken down into an area in between the conveyors where employees on the floor will package that up. So there's packaging material, and there's some glue, and there's some tape, and there's people. And so that's the area where you've got a concentration of combustible corrugated materials um, that would produce, and a lot of oxygen, because it's open packaging that would produce the greatest level of smoke and hot gases to set off the sprinkler system. So running this smoke model, that was the farthest point down off of the ceiling that the smoke interface layer ran. So you can see we've got 29 feet to the underside of the roof deck, 24 feet off the floor. So the smoke only came down to five feet before the sprinkler system was activated and put out the fire. What is that? Where it says smoke interface layer, mm -hmm. the line points. Is that another conveyor belt system? What is that gray? Are you referring to yeah. this right here? Yeah. Yeah. In this particular facility, this is ductwork. So this stair is just up there to maintain that.
This is board number eight. This is information that you'll find in the smoke model output file. And you can see here, there's the, the origin of the fire. And if you look here, you will see that gray line. That's the smoke interface layer. That's as far down from roof deck as it came. And you can see that it took five minutes, 300 seconds to get to that point. This is a, this is a big building. This is board number nine. This is another image. When we run the smoke model, it gives us a, video, a very large video. So we take um, static snapshots of the video to try to capture some of the information to share with today. Um, what we're trying to show you here is these are all the sprinkler heads. We actually take the floor plan of the building and then we create a 3D architectural model of that and we insert every sprinkler head from the fire protection plans into the model so the system knows what nodes are going to get hit with that smoke and hot gas so that it knows exactly what sprinkler head goes off. And you can see again that the interface layer 23.95, 24 feet above the floor. So some of you may be familiar with the historical data that the National Fire Protection Association gathers. And the NFPA Research Council puts out a report every 10 years. And what they do is they take the data from every fire reported in the country. And then they categorize it by the size of the building, the type of the building, the type of construction, whether or not it had a fire uh, suppression system, whether it was a dry or a wet sprinkler system, whether there were standpipes, there's an enormous amount of data. I did not print that report for you. It's larger than the smoke output file. Um, but this is uh, taken directly from this. And this report, by the way, is, is uh, in the public domain. And you can see here the reliability of sprinklers historically. And like I say, this, this report comes out every 10 years. And this information here, this 95% of reliability of percent of fires confined to object or room of origin. This number has fluctuated between 94 and 96% since I got into business a long time ago. Um, and in fact, I would argue that with uh, advances in, in code enforcement um, and in the information age, um, that sprinklers are more reliable and are probably tested more and recorded more today than perhaps they ever were. And you can see here, one sprinkler is usually enough to control a fire. In 77% of structure fires where sprinkler operated, only one operated. In 97% of structure fires, five or fewer operated. Um, we did a study uh, for a project not far from here a few years ago. Um, it was a different type of occupancy, but it was really interesting what this report showed about that type of facility. And what it showed was that in, I, I don't remember exact figures, but something like 80% of the fires reported, the fire was extinguished by the time the fire department arrived on site. And the average time for a fire department to arrive on site is two minutes, two and a half minutes, somewhere in there. Um, so really significant about how these sprinklers are functioning exactly how they're designed. And oh, by the way, in, in this particular facility, um, these are um, control mode density sprinklers. They're large drop sprinklers. Um, they have an enormous K factor. They dump a lot of water on the fire. 
one of the reasons for that is um, if you have a, uh, a large warehouse like this and you don't use either an ESFR or a controlled mode density sprinkler head, then you have to put smoke hatches throughout the entire roof. Now, this building does have smoke hatches. There are 13 smoke hatches. They operate at 450 degrees Fahrenheit. They operate at 450 degrees Fahrenheit because the temperature rating for the sprinkler heads is 385 degrees. So we don't want those smoke hatches operating automatically because if all the hot gases from the fire are uh, taken away from the building through the smoke hatches, the sprinkler heads won't go off. And we're introducing more oxygen to the fire. And it's, you know, I, I was telling our, our clients here, um, if you go to uh, most of Europe and Asia, they've completely done away with smoke hatches in these large warehouses for that very reason. So they put in some other safeguards, um, some unidirectional fans that can be operated by the fire department. So if they want to evacuate smoke after the fire's under control, they can do that. Um, in this particular case here, they could do that as well. This is board number 11. And this board shows a, a lot of information. Um, the biggest thing that we would like to, to draw the board's attention to here is the fact that you saw that the smoke interface layer, even though it never fell further down than 24 feet above the floor, it took five minutes to do that, okay? And you can see here, just you know, without running an egress model, just using basic fire protection data on the speed of travel for an average adult walking to an exit from this point on the floor right next to the fire, I've got 46 seconds to get to the nearest exit. These are the conveyors, by the way, that you're looking at in here. And they're all at about desk height or so. And the reason you see this funny line is we have we have with these devices that have been uh, approved by the IEC. I call them jump stairs, but essentially um, they're stairways that you can walk up with a landing and walk down the other side so that the people that are working in between the two conveyor belts can get out and exit the facility. So I also like to point out all of these green dots here are all of the exit points around the facility. We have more exits than the code would otherwise require. This is board number 12. This board focuses primarily on exiting. So the code, of course, only triggers a third exit. All other things being considered, only triggers a third exit where the occupant will exceed 500. Um, and as I explained in, in the narrative, if you use the, the densities in Table 1004 in the code to determine how many people this facility could hold, you have over 300 people. That's not how many people work in these facilities. Um, they don't need that many people. This is a very efficient operation. I mean, these people do this all over the country. And so all of these exit points around here <coughs> create exit capacity far in excess of what would be necessary for even the calculated occupant load. Not, not to say the actual occupant load. That's it, that's it. All right, um, so what we'll do uh, next is we'll have the board members open it up for the board members to ask some questions. Okay. Um, 
Shaheen, you want to start us? Okay. A couple questions. The entire building is sprinklered with ESFR heads? So well, they're important. control mode density, which is similar to LA. That's correct. Um, the entire building? The entire warehouse. Warehouse, but not the canopy structure. Well, the canopy structure is sprinklered, it is but it doesn't have the same type of head. It doesn't have the same type of hazard. No. And the building, the interior of the building is classified, is it ordinary hazard? In terms of sprinkler coverage? You're not certain? No, it's storage hazard. Storage. What we're you're talking about is, is classified by NFPA 13? Yes. Storage hazard. Storage hazard. Yeah. Well, is that extra hazard? I'm going to defer to the architect of record to answer that question. Would you like to come up? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Should I state, uh, state your name and Adam Schwack? Sorry? Adam Schwack. Okay, and you with? I'm with Aquas Design. Okay, good. Thank you. I was just hoping to confirm what the uh, uh, category of hazard was for the sprinkler system design that was provided since there's such a large point made on the sprinkler. Is it, my understanding is it could be light, ordinary, or extra hazard. And then an ordinary or extra could be group one or two. And I was just trying to clarify if you knew which one it was. Okay. Um, well, we were uh, ordinary one. Ordinary one, correct, correct. And that's due to the fact that the storage is limited to 12 feet in height, because I believe if it was higher than that, you would trigger different requirements? That's correct. That's correct. And, and typically, the storage doesn't uh, exceed the racking, which is typically closer to seven feet in height. Okay. Yeah. And w would it be fair to say that if the future tenant took on the building, they would physically have the capability to expand that storage, in which case that would trigger a larger uh, hazard. I'd also like to make a case in point in terms of that, that, you know, I understand that a, an occupant versus a, a real occupant load versus a fictitious one, but again, the building could be sold and repurposed and an occupant load can always change for anything. Um, well, the, the sprinkler system is um, designed only up to 12 feet, so only up to 12, great. You know, without modifications, you wouldn't be able to, be able to do increase the storage beyond that. That's actually a very good point. Which would have to be approved, of course. Sure. And then, so I just wanted to clarify a couple of things also that were on the application. Um, it was it was noted on the application that alternatives were provided, and I wanted to clarify what the alternatives were. Um, or maybe you would rather strike that from the application. Um, not also, I'm sorry, physically or legally impractical, impractical, impracticable, and then would be unnecessary in light of alternatives. I just want to clarify if, how those two factors were met. Yeah. Or if it was strictly. Uh, so I'll draw your attention to page four, the petition page. Well, alternative number one was small occupant load. I, I won't bore you with reading all of this again. I'm sure you've all read this. Um, but to your point, Shaheen, earlier about uh, another tenant coming in, if another tenant came in and they had a different racking plan, whether it was denser or taller, they would have to apply for a permit in the whole spring. Because it's, a, because it's a change in the application of the code. You know, and, and before you make your second point on the number of factors, may I clarify, what's the, the largest travel distance in this building? Yeah. And, and and would it be physically possible to only provide two exits and still meet travel distance? Because I, I don't know if that's an accurate representation of saying that you only need two exits because if you really only had two exits, how would you meet the travel distance in every point of the building? So, so, so I understand that only two is required, but in effect, you, more is required to meet travel distance. So. I draw your attention to alternative number three on page five. You'll see the allowable travel distance in this kind of a facility, and that's one one story in height is 400 feet. The actual largest travel distance from the most remote area on the floor is 254 feet. Can you point that location out on the, the plan for us? Where you're saying that 254 is from? I'm going to have to pull up another board because it's being hidden by this. Okay. Table. 
that location is right here. Uh, please just indicate which uh, which slide you were talking. Uh, or do you so refer we're to? looking at board number 11. We do have a copy of this plan. And uh, the column grid is cut off on this page. But there's, a, there's an indicator here, 10-01A. And that's, that's the location for the most remote area on the floor that has the greatest travel distance. And that would be taken to which exit door? So, when we run um, maximum travel distance, we find that midpoint so that they can get to either one of these exits here and not more than 254 feet. Can you use your hand and demonstrate that on the plan? It would have been helpful if it was drawn on this. So it's this exit here and this exit here um, we can describe those as the two intermediate exits on the top of the page. It, it would seem to me with the conveyor belts in the way that that travel distance would actually be closer to 23-08. Um, between where the conveyor belts it takes the 90 degree. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, so but, enough center right here. Right. But can we just refer to what drawing number he's using? Yeah, he did it right. Number eleven. Slide eleven. Yeah, or drawing eleven. A jump stair, but you have to once you get over that jump stair, you have to go all the way to the lower left or all the way over to the right. But No, just graphically, it seems like there are. I'm just wondering what the distance from 2308 to the closest. I don't have that. Okay. And, and then just to, to, to finish that point, so if there's, I, I understand these alternatives. I, I just want to state that I somewhat believe that these are just a factor of the design of the building. I, I, I don't necessarily believe there is very much increased alternative safety here. Oh, that's my personal opinion. Um, and then and then why would be why would it be physically impractic, impractical to install the, the fire protection? That I didn't understand, and I'm not sure that was presented. So. So if this condition were to have been discovered at the time of permitting. Well, that it is the architect of records duty to provide a proper code analysis. It's not the, the you understand town that? to provide that. No, but you're, I'm answering your question. Please. So if, if they were given a chance to design a roof ceiling assembly at that time, then there would be no hardship. So doing it at this juncture is a great hardship. The building is under construction. There's pipe and conduit and wire and ductwork, and there's a lot of things in, in place. So, you know, the options for providing, um, you know, a fire rate of that roof ceiling assembly are they're challenging. Could you further elaborate on the challenges? Is it because couldn't it just be sprayed on to it? For, and I'm sorry for my ignorance. I'm just trying to. No, understand. no, no. That's a very good question. So, um, cementitious spray applied fireproofing in order to to spray the members, of this, especially with open roof joists like this, um, you really have to be able to get around all the cords, all the bracing elements, and it's just. It's not really practical to do. I don't know how you would do that without going in and removing all the pipe and all the conduit and everything else that's fastened to the underside of the bottom cord with the joists. Um, and that's currently installed. This picture is not today. That picture is showing the outside. That's the outside canopy. The inside of the building is over here. And it's all plumbed and, and mechanical and everything is already in. Okay. So, that makes sense. I understand that. Yeah. Is there any other storage under that canopy aside from the vehicles that are servicing the building? No. There's no refueling of the vehicles happening there? No. No. 
how many levels are under that parking? Just just one level of parking underneath, or is there multiple levels of parking underneath? Um, there's two different types of parking underneath there. One is for the delivery vans, and one is for what they call associate parking, or employee parking. So they're they're at different levels because of the different heights required. But again, I draw your attention to the fact that there's a three-hour transfer slab between the parking and and the warehouse up above. It's Meaning it's like 12 inch thick, somewhere around. Right? Yeah, like a 12 inch slab. It doesn't need to be 12 inches thick, but the engineer record is here. I, no biggie. That's fine. And is the parking under the whole facility? But let me, are you done, Ashim? Actually, I just had like a couple little questions. Sorry. Okay. And then I'm not sure if it was clarified. So we got the travel distance from inside the building. Is there a travel distance? Under that canopy that's designated, I'm not sure how travel distance would apply there in an open, open air structure. structure. Doesn't apply, you know. Um, so the the doors that are along that north side of the building are considered exit discharge doors. So once we exit the building, we're into a free area. Um, we're no longer exposed to the hazards from smoke and fire. Um, that's a that's a three hour exterior wall. Um, the wall acts as a fire barrier. So, um, in fact, there's some some current discussion about um, delineating the dedicated path of travel for um, people exiting out that north side of the building, so that the local code officials can be assured that there won't be any activity or any anything other than unobstructed path of travel to get to the east side and and leave the, the complex. Um, I guess the only other question I had is just it was also stated there's a two to two and a half minute response time from the fire department. Has that been verified with the with the town? These are national averages. National average. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and and that's not part of our narrative. That was just a you know a statement that we were making about a different project where by the time they got to the the building where the structure fire was, the fires had been extinguished by the sprinkler system. Just to, I do want to make you aware that a lot of times that, that information is provided to us as a part of, and accurately from the town, so that's why I asked because it's right. But again, we're not this is not an alternative or a or a finding that we presented as part of our understood. our narrative. We shouldn't consider Thank you. People. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jane? Uh, so back to the parking. Is the parking under the entire building and canopy? I'm going to ask Mr. Flack to address that question again. Just state your name again. Sure. Hi, this is Kevin Flack with Aquas Design. Uh, yes, I can confirm that the, uh, the two levels of van parking are below the warehouse and the canopy. Um, how many, what's the maximum number of workers at any given time that will be in the building? Um, maximum number of workers, I think we can speak this time. Good morning, Danielle Aristi, Senior Entitlements Manager with Amazon. Um, so that number is estimated to be about 100 right now. Um, and there are different shifts. So that could be spread out through the different shifts. The bulk of those um, associates would be working fire and over during the overnight hours. Okay. I noticed that you have a very large break room and then a training room. So will there be training sessions being held while the factory is well, while the um, operations are are going on. So if you have 100 people working, will you also have additional people that are coming in for training? Not typically at that same time. I mean, those training sessions would not occur during the um, typically will not occur during the process where the packages are being inducted and then sorted. That would happen later in the, the morning hours as the warehouse typically quiets down. So then what, I mean, there's 152 seats shown in the break room. What's the, such a large? 
break more room. Well, we do reserve more um, space and availability for the seasonal um, uptick in employees, which would typically occur during our peak time of year, which is, you know, from Black Friday through, um, I'd call it New Year's Day. So during those peak times, you'll have more than 100 employees working? We could. It, it really depends on the, the capacity of the, you know, customer demand and the, the building. Would you, would, does anybody know where the closest fire department is? Yes. And what's the distance to the fire department? I know because I'm on the fire. All right, why don't you come up and... Uh, you want to hear from the horse's mouth? I'll tell you. <laughs> Del Pinelli, Town of Mount Pleasant, uh, head building inspector, one town hall plaza. Uh, to answer your question, okay, I'm I'm a fire commissioner for the Hawthorne Fire District. I'm also an ex chief, been a 43 year volunteer member. Our department is 100% volunteer. Mm -hmm. The firehouse is actually in the middle of Hawthorne, and it's probably in the estimate of about a mile away from. The building and to answer his question about response time okay when you're a volunteer organization as you know it's not paid it's not career you don't have staff on duty so volunteers it's a lot different it's not a two to three minute response time it could be five to eight minute response time during the during the day on you know work hours during the day okay because it's a, it's a whole lot different on the volunteer side than it is on a career side Okay, well, we are about a mile away from uh, from the building itself. Okay. So do you think the response time would be at night? At night, it pro I, I would estimate maybe five minutes. By the time the members get to the building, dress up, get on the apparatus, and and go. You know, I mean, it's a, it's the route is pretty direct, but it is it is pretty much like the the firehouse would be in the middle, and Amazon's out here, so it's got a you know it's a little bit of a run. And typically, you would have some members responded right to the scene. No, not in our department. No, everybody goes to the firehouse. The only people that respond to the scene is the three, the chief and the two assistants. And that's it. Everything else has to be responded out of the firehouse. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Do I have this, Chief? Megan? Uh, yes. So I wanted to ask um, about the operation inside the warehouse. We have conveyor belts. Um, they're run by elect electric power or any other fuel source for the conveyor belt machinery. I'm going to ask Danielle to address okay. the question. Would you come up again? Your name again? Hi, this is Adam Schwach with Aquas Design. The conveyor system is uh, running electrical. Electrical. Yes. Are there any other forklifts or any other machinery in here not manually operated for um, coating? No forklifts, um, no pallet jacks. Okay. Uh, hydrogen is where I was going. Okay. Um, uh, I think my question about the conveyor belts was answered. Uh, they are the height of the table, and you have to um, climb up a stair and over and climb back down a stair. Um, the sprinkler heads are where, so we have a 29-foot uh, ceiling height. Where are the sprinkler heads located above the floor? So the sprinkler heads are, they, they range jet, the exact height on that they go. 25 feet. You need to come up and introduce yourself. Jack Carroll, Phelps Construction. The sprinkler heads are approximately 25 feet above the floor. Okay. Thank you. Um, and it was noted that at about 385 degrees, that's when the sprinkler heads operate. So, oh, I thought the hatches were 450. The hatches are 450 degrees. Oh, right. oh. 
No, that's okay. I, it, it, I don't know that it matters for my question. My question is um, if a fire starts at, you know, three feet above the floor, how long before the sprinkler head, like approximately how long before they, you're talking about the sprinkler, you know, putting out 95% of the fires, um, but these seem to be really far from the source of the potential fire. So I'm wondering if there's a delay in their activation compared to the sprinklers that are noted in these, the research that you've done. Six, the five, you can pull that for okay. if you'd like to see that again. Oh, okay, okay. Yep. So it takes that long for enough hot gases to build up to surround the bulb and the sprinkler head to break the bulb and discharge water out of the head. Mm -hmm. So for five minutes, the fire is growing. The fire is growing. How are these 100 plus um, employees alerted during, are they alerted during that five minutes that, that this fire is growing and they should be getting out? Yes. So there's, there's a fire alarm system with detection devices. So the minute it reads smoke, then the um, notification devices go off and they're all alerted and they're all trained on how to stop what they're doing and shut down the conveyor and exit the facility. Can you clarify what type of notification systems? There's horns and strobes? Audio visual yeah, notification sure. devices. Yeah. I think too that your question would apply to the smoke detectors as well. Where are they located high off the floor mm -hmm. and how long will it take for them to trigger the alarm? So the smoke detectors are located in the joist bays. So the smoke that we didn't, when we ran the smoke model, what we were looking for is that the time for that smoke interface layer to come down and those hot gases to build up enough to discharge the sprinkler head. Mm -hmm. So we didn't run the model to see how fast a detection device would go off, but they're very quick. Should be quicker than the head, right? Oh, yes, yes. Um, might there be an option to also place uh, smoke detectors lower than the joist phase? I understand they're required in the joist phase, but um, is there a way to um, provide something that would alert occupants sooner? Yes, um, there's, a, there's a device called a beam detector. So beam detectors uh, are a transmitter and receiver, and they could be located at, at any height. Um, Does this building have beam detectors in it? No, no, it's not designed to have beam. Oh. I mean, that system's not installed yet. The right. building's right. under construction, but. Um, can somebody tell me when the building permit was issued? Uh, the building permit issue date was in the petition. It was July 13th, 2020. July 13th. I'm sorry, that was the application date. The permit was issued on October 28th, 2021. Okay, um, so the town's comments, um, first comments questioning the fire resistance rating of the roof structure came after the permit was issued. That's correct. Um, by a little less than a month. No, actually that was, that was uh, brought to about a year and a month. Yeah, yeah a little over a year. Okay. Um, the, the town, uh, I, I don't want to speak for Sal, but the town uses a September, September 8, 2021. And you said August 28th, 2021, um, which would be a little over a week. Um, when, October. October 28th, 2021 is when the permit was issued. 
Oh, October. So after the town's comments uh, on nine. Right. You have, you're going to have to come up here if you're going to speak. Okay. I, I, I can Okay. I'm referring to um, the first paragraph in a letter from the building department of town of Mount Pleasant that was included in our um, paperwork. And it said the original comments from the plan review dated September 8th, 2021, pertaining to this project. And they did question the fire resistance rating for the roof construction at that time. So I'm wondering how the permit got issued without a resolution to that comment. And um, then how building construction happened without anyone going back to dot their I's and cross their T's about this fire resistance rating of the roofing. Adam, would you like to uh, address that? Hi, Adam Schwach with Equus Design. Um, our office uh, only recently received the comments um, regarding the um, rated roof construction. So we were a little, we were a little over a year into construction when we received those comments. Okay, then I will follow up when the town um, speaks up. I guess I'll follow up about where those comments <laughs> were delivered. Um, I think so. I was going to ask about the canopy um, over the truck loading area and why that can't just be constructed to be the 60 feet back from the property line. Um, it would still cover a, a large portion, but I'm not sure that that actually resolves your issue of the, the fire resistance rating of the roof anyway. Um, if that canopy were, I guess, my, okay, my question is, if the canopy were pulled back to meet that 60 foot line, you still have the parking structure underneath it, um, which is within 60 feet of that property line. I realize it's a separate building and you said the horizontal slab is three hours. I don't know about um, the side wall or, or foundation wall of that structure. Um, but I had wondered if pulling that canopy back resolves any of this uh, concern. So if I may, if you were looking at just the parking structure down below, that's an S2 occupancy. So the S2 occupancy doesn't, uh, is not subject to the same provisions as an S1 occupancy. So in theory, Correct. If the canopy were to be pulled back 60 feet off of the boundary, then they would have been permitted to build this of type 2B construction without any fire resistance rating other than the transfer slab between the low grade parking space and the warehouse above. Okay. Um, I think that concludes my question. Do we have time? Or Mark, um, the reminder. Yeah, Mark, sure. Okay, uh, Mark Cavanaugh, uh, do you have any questions? Yes, I, I do. So the, the first question that I'm trying to understand is, is the height issue. I see in the application, they identified the height at 52 feet, five inches, but on page seven of the report, it indicates as part of your argument for reduced fuel loads, that the height of the top, or, or the, the height is 29 feet above finished floor to the deck. So, do we have a deck height from finished floor uh, to the bottom of the deck as 29 feet, or is it something greater? This is Adam Schwach with Aquas Design. I can confirm that it's 29 feet, 4 inches. Okay. And then our commodity storage, uh, I, I read was the rack was going to be um, somewhere around the 8 foot, and then you're going to have storage on the top of the rack, but never to exceed 12 feet. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and then the uh, 
back to the uh, the sprinkler questions with the, we were wrestling with. I understand uh, we're going with rack storage for design. So, what, um, how are you classifying the, the the commodity? So, what commodity classification will you be using as part of the sprinkler design? Uh, class four commodities, Mark. Thank you. And then, what sprinkler density uh, are we going to be designing to? You're referring to the K factor of the con control mode density sprinkler heads. No, I'm I'm referring to the volume of water. So, you know, a, a light head would be 0.1 over 1500, but I know we're we're not doing it to that style. But what what density would we be using? Are we going point? Yeah, I don't have that information with me, but I can tell you that. Uh, we engaged a licensed fire protection engineer to design the system, and there's a, a private uh, fire pump on site to meet the hydraulic demand of the system. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the next question I have was on the canopy protection. Uh, I know we're then going back to uh, NFPA 13, I believe, for that protection. So, what what uh, what hazard did we uh, identify for the canopy in this protection? I believe what they're using is a standard upright storage head designed for that use. I believe the K factor was 12, and of course, they're dry sprinkler heads. Correct. And uh, last question, does this building have any standpipes in it? I'm sorry, say it again, please. Does this building have any standpipe? Standpipes? Yeah. No. Correct. Well, I'm sorry. Yes. For, for far use, so I'm, I'm trying to I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to re understand the, the Methods the fire department will be able to extinguish a fire in there, and since it's a large building and has long lays and understanding of sprinklers, uh, but maybe an alternate might be able to provide standpipes in order to help the fire department advance hose lines. I believe there are standpipes in the stair towers that go down into the parking levels. Is it? That is correct. But you don't have any standpipes on the floor itself. No. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I have at this time. Okay. So the fire department connections on the outside of the building. Is there? Yes. Okay. Well, location. I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but the location I believe was uh, determined by the local fire department. It's along the drive on the east um, elevation, close to the Sawmill River Road. Okay. And then you mentioned there was a fire pump. On site, yes, yes, I couldn't. and where's that located? That's also on the east side, very close, uh, just past the right of way. And it'll be an underground fire tank system. Okay. Um, the obviously fire truck will be able to come in on the in the entrance on the north side up of Soma River Road. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and then it, it would be able to just. Go right in underneath the canopy section. Um, they would be the canopy would be weight restricted to a certain vehicle size. Be, you know, beyond in other words, driving underneath. If, if you're driving over the underground parking, you can't take a full size uh, fire truck due to the loading. Height wise, it's okay, but load wise, it, it's you, you're saying it's actually load wise, but we will have height detectors there to prevent. An overweight vehicle from going on that portion. So really, then you only have access to the fire truck. Only has access to two sides of the building, correct? Does it access to three sides? So there is a. And if I can, Jack, if you want to come up, you want to explain the how the stone road is, the path is being constructed along the west. Jack Carroll, Phelps Construction. So fire truck could enter on the north. The north driveway, which would be the east side of the building, they could also enter in the southern driveway and get to the southern side of the building. And from there, wrap around the west side of the building where you'll see there's a, uh, a stone road or a fire road. Okay, so that gravel or stone road is just for 
fire department access only. That's right. correct. Okay. And it's designed to hold 25,000 pounds? Yes. And you did state that the fire department did review all of the connection points and the access plan and they approved. We've had a place, would you like to speak to that, please? Adam Pike, Aquas Development, uh, developer on the project. Uh, yes, uh, that was done with um, a comment from um, the building department with the fire department as well back in uh, May of uh, April through May of 2020. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, that's all I had. Only as far as questions, do oh, you want to you have a follow up? Go ahead. I just wanted to clarify what was the type of standpipe system in the building? Is it class one or class three? Does it have a post cabinet in there? Anybody knows? I don't know off the top of my head. No. Oh. And, uh, and, and just as a part of the uh, Amazon's procedure and workers, is, any, is there anybody designated as a fire watch or anybody trained who will provide any sort of additional? safety on site, if, if anybody wants to elaborate on that, that does exist. So let, let me just yep. comment one thing. So you use the term fire watch. Fire watch has a very distinct meaning and it's true. the National Fire Protection Association. When a fire protection system has been decommissioned or taken out of service, and, it's true. and that person is dedicated to um, watching the building, no other activities. So if you mean, is there a uh, person who's the safety officer yes. for the facility. Thank you for clarifying. I'd like to uh, answer that. Uh, sure. Oh, Sonia, the Amazon. Um, so yes, we do have dedicated safety personnel. Uh, we do regular stand-ups, like you were talking about. We call them a stand-up at the beginning of the shift where they go over safety calls, things like that. There's a regular training on egress. Um, and then we also have people uh, called our RME, or reliability maintenance engineers, uh, that are actually fire watch certified for the facility just in case so would you be able to comment on how many of those people are staffed at a time uh so rme there is typically one to two people um from rme for sure they work on road they work on rotating shifts uh with some overlap so thank you is it a sorry? Is it a requirement by Amazon to have them fire watch certified? Uh, it is something that we have in our policy just in case. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Go ahead, man. Um, slide four, the photo of the construction. When was that taken? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Carroll Phelps construction, approximately six weeks ago. Six weeks ago. Okay. Um, so it, it says here in the application the work started August of 2021. The permit was issued October of 2021. So work started prior to issuance of a permit. Is that correct? Jack Carroll, Post Construction. We began site work and foundation work ahead of time as we had a permit specific for that. Mm -hmm. And my last question is at what percentage complete um, is the project now? Approximately 70 percent. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to um, anyone here in the audience. <clears throat> Um, who would like to speak either in support or opposition to the application? Good morning. Sal Pinelli, County Mount Pleasant Head Building Inspector, one Town Hall Plaza, the Hall of New York. Um, I represent the town building department uh, on this project. So uh, we had uh, uh, not you know, we didn't we didn't agree with the variance, so we did not support it. Uh, that's why we're here today, um, and it's for for reasons why we we sent you a letter and a package of of documents. I have um, 
I have two of my colleagues with me, uh, Dave Hunter and Jeff Walker from JW uh, Plan Review, uh, that we've extensively gone through all of this, and I'm going to have Dave present our part as representing the town, his uh, part of our case to you, okay? Yeah. All right, Dave? Thank you. Yeah, please, I'd like to have you as close to the microphone as possible. And forgive my call. My name is David Hunter. I am with JHW Plan Review Services. Jeff is on the phone call also. He's more technical, technically advanced than I am, so he is there for that support. Uh, Jeff, can you say hello, please? Just let me know he's there. Yes. Hello. Yes, I'm I'm here. I just can want to make sure you're there. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Great. Um, I don't know if you want background or any of that on that. But we're from Birmingham, Alabama, back in the old Southern Building Code days. Uh, both Jeff, myself, and our staff are former ITC employees. Uh, I was there for a little more than nine years. Jeff was there for a little bit more than 17. We were responsible for the plan review department for the International Code Council up until 2020, um, and then have been doing JHW plan review services then, since then. Um, Quite simply put, what we what we have here, and a lot of time was spent talking about life safety fire stuff. What we have is a fire rating issue based on the fact that an unlimited building area does not qualify for this project. And so the ratings are what are at the issue there. And I just want to try to, as is stated in the town's discussion of opposition, basically how this thing works. And it's relatively simple in my opinion. Um, I got somebody that has a need for a building. The need is based on how big, what they're gonna do inside of it. I start to program it in my design to figure out what I can do because I have to identify a type of construction. And as I work through in a big project like this, the majority of the time we're looking for the unlimited access. That doesn't happen here. So now I have to design the building pursuant to chapter five. That's where our issue is. It's a rating issue. It's a structure safety protection issue. All the sprinkler systems in the world, great, wonderful. They don't exclude the requirements of ratings. So I just throw that out in a humble suggestion as you work through it, stay focused on that, which actually is the point of contention to the admission just a little while ago. They only have access to three sides of the building. Eliminate unlimited. If you look back to the title in original code summary on this project, they clearly intended to have this canopy area, warehouse area, aggregate area square footage, which is eliminated due to not having that access. So therein lies the water down. I mean, I'm from the South, keep it down there simple where the goats graze. That's that's what we're looking at. Um, I haven't heard any conversation as to what happens to somebody on an adjacent piece of property. And I sure as heck haven't heard anything um, when Sal and his guys come to that fire, who's looking out for them. And so those are just some of the things, I think the biggest points of contention that are in the request for the variance uh, or, or just miss, I don't want to say slide a hand, but just missing that which code says. Um, the canopy, 
is it a canopy, is it not a canopy? Um, if you looked at it from, say, a manufacturing or a factory type situation, technically, that canopy area will function just like the end of the line of a steel mill will. That's ultimately where they're going and what they're doing. So just a common sense approach to here's the fundamental issues. This is what happened. This is how it happened. This is the remedy for it. Um, I haven't been in the building in a while. I know it's up in construction, but again, I don't. Yeah, it's going to cost a little bit more to spray it now as it would have been then. But again, I don't understand how you never thought you weren't going to have a rating. I still don't know um, what the proposed rating is. There's no conversation as to that. It's about look at all these other things. We've got smoke taken care of. We've got fire. We've got people getting out of the building, which is great. But we're not focusing on the structural fire issue. Um, and again, like the, the sprinkler systems, it doesn't preclude the ratings. So that's pretty much where the town of Mount Pleasant is. Jeff, is there anything else you might want to articulate on? Yeah, yeah, let me see. There's a few things uh, you, you, you did pretty well with that. <laughs> uh, the, the fact the building is 1A and the fact that uh, it, it's never it, it 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 was never really on the plan. It was on the original code study that we we got a long time ago for it. And obviously the building has to be one A due to the fact that it can't be unlimited area. Um, you know, um, section five oh eight of the code, I think, or maybe five oh seven. Uh talks about the unlimited area. Of course this doesn't meet it, doesn't have sixty feet around the whole perimeter. Um, of course has a sprinkler system, but doesn't have the sixty feet, so so with that, uh, you're, the only way you can get the area here is to go type 1A construction. And type 1A construction, uh, table 50, um, no, I'm sorry, table 601 requires the ratings for type 1A construction. Um, and with that, uh, I don't know if there's anything else that I know of. Everything we've looked at, um, of course, the life safety, Got to have that. That's great. It's laid out very well. The sprinkler system, great. Above and beyond, probably what NFPA 13 requires as a minimum. Uh, those things are somewhat detached, not detached, but they're still don't really the fact that your fire separation distance is uh, such that you have to have, uh, you know, that we have to have a ratings for all the building elements. And uh, so with that, um, along with the fact that the original drawings uh, actually had some uh, details, they were very general about uh, rated ceiling assemblies. Now those may, and, and it, it didn't really delineate exactly where those were um, in the plans, but that's the only place that I saw in the original drawings that uh, the, from the original report back in September of uh, um, 2001 or 2021, um, that's the only place where I saw anything dealing with a rating for the roof structure. And even it was kind of such, you know, you know, and on the re re reply to that, it kind of, there was really no uh, additional information given. So um, other than that, I guess it's, yeah, along with Dave's uh, general thought of uh, the reality is when that structure outside, which, you know, by general definition of the canopy, but by code definition, since there is a use group underneath there, it is a S2 um, loading situation. You have commodities coming in and out of there. And I always like to use the uh, fact that when you freeze something a moment in time, is there a fuel load? You know, there's not, there's no such thing as a clock in the code. You either have a fuel load there, you don't have a fuel load there at any given moment. So, so with that, what's going on under that canopy, what we're calling, uh, is a use group and therefore is part of the overall floor area. It's under a roof. And uh, and the question is what happens when that uh, structure, if it does, uh, if there is a fire event under that structure, you know, in, in relation to the, uh, relation to the uh, other building on the other side of the property or the lot line. So, so I guess,
get to that. Um, other than that, I, I, I think we're just uh, making sure that as the building site one A, I'm not sure how you can um, not get the rated roof or not require the the rate require the uh, rated roof. That's hard to say. Um, with uh, unless there's and of course the variance is what what we're here for. But but with that, that's just our stance. I don't know. It might be a dangerous precedent if you uh, do say okay, we can have a building of this size not meeting the unlimited area requirement, and but we can call it one A construction, but it's not rated. Um, that seems to be a little disjointed, but but anyway, but that's the uh, but that's all I have, <laughs> and hopefully that'll um, make sense. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, is there anyone else here or on the conference call who would like to uh, speak? Okay. And a place access development. Um, uh, throughout the process, we have been working collectively with with the town, um, having regular meetings um, on site and off. Um, and one of the additional things is, you know, when it comes to emergency response systems, et cetera, you know, we have through these meetings identified. Um, an emergency uh, communication repeater system um, that was a recommendation by the town. Um, we've moved forward with it, um, you know, at considerable additional cost to the project. Um, so I just want to make note of that so that um, it's on record as you guys are deliberating that, you know, we've been collectively working through this project um, and taking additional steps as they become um, practical within the project and by the town, you know, through the process and construction. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, you mentioned that no one has proposed uh, the rating for the roof. Mm -hmm. What would code require? Hour and a half. Hour and a half. Hour and a half. Hour and a half. Look, at, and that's where some of this thing gets off the rails a little bit. Um, go to table 601, which is where they're facing their argument is going to get the exemption. What it would allow you to do if that scenario worked is to take certain elements of the type one construction, eliminate it, use type one B. So you would be looking at the one and a half because it has to stay in the A. And the reason for that, the footnote B, which oftentimes gets left out, I learned a long time ago when you see people copying code, pay real close attention because they're about to rewrite code. And so the, the footnotes in there are in there for a reason and it, and it excludes it based on its occupancy, which then goes back to is it a canopy or is it not a canopy? If it's a canopy, why has it got an occupancy? Why was it included in the original general aggregate square footage of the building? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Pinelli, can you explain the background behind, obviously there was a, the issue was raised before the permit was issued uh, in September of 2021, and then the permit was issued for construction of the building in October. There was the permitting phase. It was done in phases. The permitting was done in phases. Okay, so they required, uh, they, they came to me and um, submitted their permit application, submitted their drawings, okay? They only submitted structural drawings at that time. So I, I had given them a first permit for site work and land clearing, okay? That was the initial permit, <laughs> okay, that was issued. Okay, right. so there was a permit. Let me stop right He said it was for site work and foundation work. Well, it was, you're right, it was, it was, the, it was the, the, the site work, and then we had a, a just foundation. Okay. Okay, just it's foundation. Common practice. Right. Okay. Especially on a large project, you know, knowingly that the plan review for the whole for the whole project, which wasn't submitted all at one time, I didn't get any of the MEPs. Uh, that came later on down the road. So I 
obviously said, okay, I don't have a problem with this. We'll, uh, we'll review the structure, structural plans. I had them review the structural plans for, uh, for comments, for code compliance. Um, in the meantime, I allowed them to cut the trees, land clear, strip the soil, get the, get the land ready to go for, you know, and start, and start digging the foundation because we knew that there was uh, rock involved, which is about 30,000 yards that got blasted. Okay, we had to go through a blasting permit issue through that process or whatever. So there was a lot of, uh, there was, it was understood between myself and Phelps that there was a lot of time that was gonna go by for just to get the site prepped out and get the, get the whole duck. There is two stories of a parking garage underneath the main warehouse slash distribution center. So they had to go down fairly deep. I took the plan, sent them to them for the review of the structure, okay? And then from that point, so I, they did have an initial permit for that up to the structural part, okay? And then, like I said, the MEPs and stuff came later on down the road, okay? So it got them to the point where we said, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be, um, you know, eight months, nine months, whatever, 10 months to get this thing up out of the ground and do what, it's got, what it has to do. So, the, the, so when the review was done, <coughs> we got comments back from, from JW and we presented the comments to them for their um, either agreeing with the code compliance uh, issue or disagreeing. Okay, so we did, we did go, we went through that process. That's the way I, I do all my commercial work. It always, I don't do any in-house review for commercial at all. Everything is sent out third party. It's just not time consuming, too time consuming for me to, to do that. So we got the, we get the reports, we send it to them, to their team, or whoever is in charge, and then they have to um, they have to take care of the deficiencies and send us a report back, and then I send it back to them for re-review. And at, when this occurred, what stage was the construction at? They were when this was all happening. Well, obviously the you know the the, the footings and the foundation we were coming up out of the ground at was, that point. Uh, steel up already? No. So, you know, it's, again, I, I did it as a, um, I'm gonna say I did it as a favor. I don't, I don't have to do that, but I do it for the larger projects so that it can get them started. Okay, not necessarily how I have to do that, but I did. And we got them to, to, to move along in, 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 in phases, you know. Uh, okay, yes, so that's how we did that. All right. Adam Schwack with Aquas Design again. Um, our office submitted the full remaining package for the building permit in May of 2021. Um, and the permit, Adam Pice, do you have the exact date of the permit in the fall of 2021? Yeah, uh, I told him. So our office. Who's speaking? Hi, this is Adam Schwack with Aquas Design. Oh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Our office received the comments regarding the, the challenges with or interpretation of the roof rating in, on September, it was right after Labor Day of 2022, just a few months ago. So it was, I'd say about 11 months and give or take a week or so after the full construction permit was issued. Thank you. Okay, thanks. It seems to be this guy because it's saying September 21. Yeah. Right. Mr. Pinelli, can you clarify that these comments, based on your letter dated November 30th, 2022, if you state that September 8th, 2021 is when the original comments were sent to the applicant pertaining to the fire rating of the roof issue? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, that's when we distributed the report. In 2021, in shortly after you received the full architectural and MEP package, not just two months ago. Yeah, yeah. 2020. I, actually, we just got the response back to it long ago. But yeah, my date is 9 8 2021 when that initial review report was done and issued for what's called the complete, because we did the foundation re review earlier 
prior to yes so you didn't get responses from the design team for a year, for a year. but understanding again because of the nature of the project and the fast track and the manner in which it was phased which there's a conversation in and of itself there um, it is something that the state of new york when it adopted that the international codes heavily amends chapter one and, and in so doing, it takes out a specific language to partial permitting in the manner of the process and what you do. And basically, it, it comments on it to say that if it, it can be done, doesn't have to be, shall be done, can be done. And when it is, the, the acceptor of the permit takes it at risk because there's no guarantee that another building permit will come. So that, that's a separate thing. But in the process and the flow and understanding, basically what you have is a, a lot that they dug up, they blasted a big old hole out of and filled it up with concrete steel. And so understanding there was, I don't know, 10 plus weeks of blasting, I think. Um, it wouldn't be outside the normal for there to be quite an extension of it based on the things that are going on there. So no, do I, and again, and I'm not big on, hey, you need to do, do what you're supposed to be doing. But. So it was not unusual that you didn't get an immediate response from the design team on the comments about the roof, but um, those comments could have been addressed before the roof structure started being installed. Yeah, and, and, and I don't even know if this is appropriate or not, but I, what, what I struggle with with this project is how, how I'm building something this big. Most of these projects are on large pieces of property so that you could build. It cost more money, six feet, when I was in construction, it was the average rule, that you could go down and then it was cost prohibitive. So there's a reason why it's located there. So now I have to be sensitive to the site because of where it is and the tightness of it. I don't understand how I miss, it can be 1D because it's unlimited. That, that's, the, that's my struggle constantly going through it. And I'm not trying to badger or beat on anybody. I just, I, I, don't, I don't get that part of it. I just flat out don't get it. Okay. Um. So uh, one more time, is there any other comments or that uh, anyone on the call or in person here would like to make? I, I have one more question sure. for the petition team, the petitioner team. I see a response that the, and what the town submitted to us, uh, part of your response was that you're going to uh, file a petition for variance with us here. Um, and the last sentence in that paragraph says, in the event that our request for a variance is denied, AquaQuest Development is committed to developing a code compliant resolution to the satisfaction of the town of Mount Pleasant. What um, does that look like for you? Um, to, I just want to understand what that offer means. Jim Burton again. Um, what that means is that the design team will prepare and submit an assembly showing the required training um, to satisfy the conditions. Okay. Yeah. And my backwards development. Um, going off of what Jim's comments are, yes, we will provide a code compliant building that satisfies the requirements of the code. Obviously, based on the size of the building, you know, there's um, big financial implications to completing this. So, you know, we work very closely with um, the building owner as well as um, the tenant, which is Amazon. Um, so there would be additional financial implications that have to then go back through internal processes with both of those teams to be able to complete additional funding based on the scale of economies that we're looking at with the initial costs that we've received from the construction team. Can I make a statement? Sure. I can understand what Adam is saying, 
but on the, on the behalf of the town, I need a code compliant building. I can't be worrying about financial impacts on what Amazon or anybody else has on this project. I understand it, but they have to understand my position. Okay, I need to have a safe and code compliant building. My volunteers, my department, I don't need to send them in a building that's got a that's got an incendiary fire, that's something either the sprinkler system fails or, or, or something happens, and I got guys running in there to try to put a fire out, and someone and that building collapses and, and I lose men. Okay, so I'm a, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in the fire safety. I've been in fire safety for, like I said, 43 years as a volunteer. I've seen structure fires. I've seen collapses of buildings. I've seen steel molded like this from heat from a fire. Okay, right in my town. All right, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. I need to make sure that my I need to make sure number one that the employees are safe. Okay, and I need to make sure that the first responders are safe. Okay, I just want a code compliant building. That's all I want. And, ju and just so you know, they did they did not indicate that economic burden was was an issue here with, with their initial application. They didn't, they didn't base their application on economic, economic burden. The other thing I wanted to just comment on is on your on your couple of your questions about the inside of the building, standpipes, uh, fire service access. Okay, so so. We, we knew in the beginning of the design of the building when, when, when we met with, um, with the fire district commissioners, you know, and, and the chiefs and everybody, we knew that the north side of the building was not gonna be accessible. My question came up, okay, so are, are we gonna be able to take an engine and drive it underneath there? Let's just say I got four or five vans on fire at the far west end of this building. The truck can't go on the slab because of the weight. So, okay, so we knew that, that's number one. So now what do we do for fire protection attack? It means I gotta stretch lines, the, the length of the building to get to where the fire is. Normal fire apparatus hold several hundred feet of hose. The pre-connected lines that we have on our apparatus in Hawthorne, the longest distance is 250 feet. That's it. So we can go 200 feet. If we, if we run short, we have to disconnect. We have to take hose off the truck. We have to connect and, and connect to the truck again and then and stretch out. So on an initial fire, okay, we, have, we got 250 feet. That's also, also on the inside of the building, which I know I've discussed with them and requested in the parking garage and in the building along the columns in several areas, standpipe connections because if i go inside if i'm outside the building in the parking lot how 250 feet don't get you far in the building number one from the outside so if a guy's if we're, my crews are going to go inside with their air packs on they're going to carry an apartment pack like everybody knows what apartment pack from the city you know pack of hose and whatever in that pack okay is 150 feet in that in that bed that's what you can carry in it okay now we have several of them but i'm saying is if the fire is on one end of the building and I have no way to get to it with enough hose length to put that fire out, then what good is it? So that's why I requested to them and said, back in the beginning when we were talking about sprinkling and everything, we gotta put drop, drop standpipes on the columns so that these guys have enough hose length to fight the fire in any part of that building. Because it could, it, the fire could be anywhere. Could be an electrical fire on one of the pieces of equipment. Um, you know, don't forget the, the 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 cardboard boxes. Everybody knows Amazon comes in cardboard. Everything comes in cardboard boxes. The the fire load just alone on that cardboard is 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 enough to make you nervous. Okay, but the equipment, electrical fires, anything like that. My big concern is with the fire service is the vans. They're, they're telling me they're going to, you know, they, they, they originally said they're going to bring probably three to 500 vans in there that are going to be distributed uh, out into the area. Okay. So with that many vans in there and they're, and they're, you know, they're not, they're going to go over to electric maybe or whatever they're going to do, but now they're gas or whatever. you got a lot of gas load in those trucks in the building under that distribution center, all the way downstairs in the, in the, in the, in the basement. And then the next level up, right underneath the floor deck of the uh, the distribution center. 
So you got all that fire load on vans. And let me tell you, I've been in many, many truck fires. When it goes, it goes and it gets hot and it takes from one van and it goes to the next and it's just a domino effect. So now instead of fighting one truck fire, you're fighting six truck fires. Okay, I've been there, so I, I know how it is. <clears throat> and it's 10 times harder in our parking garages because we can't get apparatus down there. So we got to depend on the guys basically hiking on foot with their packs on, with, with, with bags of holes and connections so that we can go and hit a standpipe and put the fire out. If the sprinkler, if the sprinkler system works, that's benefiting to us, thank God, okay? But if the sprinkler system don't go off for some reason or whatever, we have to fight that fire. We still got to get that fire out. So and we don't know right now if there's any standpipes on the exterior. There's no dry standpipes. So we don't know necessarily how that Well, the, the only, I believe the only, the, only, the, the, the sprinkler that's going to go out in the loading dock on the north side, which they're calling this canopy, is going to be a dry system. Right. Okay. The inside of the building is wet. Okay. In the, in the distribution center, because it's obviously heated and whatever. So, um, the standpipe, you asked about the standpipe connection. Okay. My fire department. Okay. We, we, we reviewed this all with them and whatever. Normally, normally, and what I do is, you know, being the fire marshal for the town also is I, I, I discuss the, the location. We like to have the standpipes close enough to a fire hydrant. Because what the action is by the fire service is we'll come in with the engine, we'll pull two, two and a half lines off the truck, tie it into the Y sprinkler system, and feed that system with augmented water from the fire hydrant system outside. Okay, so in this case of this building here, the, the, uh, the driveway entrance, which comes on the southeast corner off of 9A, will come in. The first, that first uh, corner of the building, which is going to be the, the southeast side, somewhere in that neighborhood is going to be that standpipe connection because that's where the water main is going to be on the east side. It's going to go in from the fire tank and the pump and the water system going into the building for, to supply water to the sprinkler system. So somewhere in that vicinity, I will have that standpipe connection for us close enough because it'll be close enough to a fire hydrant that we can, that we can hit that, okay? So again, you got this is the, I'm gonna say outside of Pepsi and Regeneron buildings that we have, this is the largest square footage building that we have in our fire district right now that's being built, okay? So it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a very big challenge for our, for our fire service, okay? We'll end up doing mutual response with other departments to cover, especially during the day, okay? Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a large building to, you know, suppress a fire in, you know, and, and if, you know, if we don't have the proper spots to get water, we're going to be done. We're not going to have, a, we're going to be in trouble. So I, that's why you're, I was glad, I'm glad you brought up about the standpipe because I've already discussed this and Jack knows it because I said we need to put standpipe drops on the columns for these guys so that I can put a hook up my apartment pack and fight the fire the way it should be, you know, and, and within distance of my hose line. If I run out of hose, I don't get to the fire. Fire keeps going. So it's just it's just a point I wanted to make about it. There's probably more than 250 feet apart. Yeah, but that's the thing. Okay, so so you know, if I got to pull off the engine 250 feet, I'm I'm lucky I'm going to get 100 feet in the building from the outside parking lot, no less. So that's why it's very important. Number one. This whole thing with the fire protection of the steel and everything else that goes along with it is very important all around, not only to protect the workers, but to protect the fire service, to protect every uh, the fire, the, the emergency services guys that got to go in there and attack this fire. Okay, don't need a piece of steel coming down on top of your head uh, because we don't have no fire protection on steel. Doesn't make sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Oh, this is, yeah, I just have a follow up question because it's not clear to me when the chief was speaking is. Uh, did Amazon then agree to put standpipes within 150 feet of, uh, of a hose length's reach to all areas of the building? Well, after you asked for the standpipes. Jack and I, Jack and I we, we discussed this and we did say that, you know, I recommended 
that we put stand pipes in the areas of columns. I didn't say every column, but I said we're gonna we're gonna try to span it out so that we can figure within the footage of the hose line that we carry in, we have water to go to. That's the key factor. So, so at this point, you're satisfied. Yeah. Have they done it? Yeah. No. Well, well, the system's being installed now. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's in construction right now. So something again that I will follow. I'm going to follow up with with them on on locations and and whatever for those certain standpipes that that we need to have in the building. Okay. okay? All right. Thanks. Okay, Mark, was that it? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. All right, so we're gonna go off the record for the purposes of going into deliberation. Uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to ask you, everybody to exit the room because we gotta bring Mark in to deliberate and that's the only way we can do that. You wanna do it in air? Yeah. With the phone? Okay. Okay. All right. We're in the small room. You could stay. We'll be back. Just gonna hit. But we're done. Right? Yeah. Thank you. all appreciate your time. Thank you. Is that good? Okay, so uh, Megan, do you have a motion? I do, Mr. Chairman. With respect to the petition of USRE Hawthorne LLC, petition number 2022-0637, the petition pertains to a construction of a warehouse, occupancy group S1 moderate hazard storage, construction type 1A, fire resistive, one story in height, 226,347 square feet in area, and located at 211, Saw Mill River Road, Town of Mount Pleasant, County of Westchester, New York State. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the Building Code of New York State, Table 601, Fire Resistance Rating Requirements for Building Elements Hours. Footnote B, which states, except in Group F1, H, M, and S1 occupancies, Fire protection of structural members in roof construction shall not be required, including protection of primary steel frame members, roof framing, and decking where every part of the roof construction is 20 feet or more above any floor immediately below. The board makes the following findings. One, subject petition pertains to a one-story sprinkler warehouse and canopy over two stories of S2 parking garage and it was determined that the structural members of roof construction were required protection according to Table 601. Two, applicant requests relief to allow the unprotected roof construction to remain and submitted exhibits proposing alternatives, including the small occupant load, additional exit numbers, capacity, remoteness, reduced fuel load, and bigger smoke chambering. Three, applicant has argued that it would be physically impracticable unnecessary because of alternatives and a change so slight to strictly comply with the code in the nearly complete construction. Four, the local code official has been contacted in this manner and does not support granting of a variance under part 1205.6. The municipality submitted their third party plan reviewers comments to document their objection. In accordance with the above findings, insufficient evidence has been provided to warrant a variance and the granting of a variance would substantially adversely affect the uniform codes provisions for health, safety, or security. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a variance from 19 NYCRR part 1221 table 601 be denied. Furthermore, it should be noted that the decision of this board is limited to the specific building and the application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of this peti petition. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Megan. Um, so we, we have a motion uh, to deny before we take it, uh, as for a second. Uh, Mr. Burton, do you understand the, uh, the motion? Okay. Okay, so I, do I have a second to that motion? Second. Jane uh, seconds it. We, we will now vote. Uh, Mark? Aye. Jane? Aye. Jane? Aye. Megan? Aye. And I also vote aye. Petition uh, is denied.
Thank you. Uh, we are off the record.